Hi, Brian from Sui Generis Brewing. It is a cloudy September day, and today we're going to make mead the hard way. So this is obviously a beehive. For those of you not familiar with how these things work, uh, this is what we would call a single brood chamber beehive. What that means is in this lower larger box is where the queen lives. Uh, this is where she lays eggs and new brood are raised. And then we add on top of this honey supers where honey is put away by the bees. And this is what we're harvesting today. Now normally between the supers and the brood box would be a plastic queen excluder. Uh, which keeps the queen in the bottom. Uh, but a couple days ago I removed that and I put into place uh, this board here. This is called a Quebec board. And what this is is a one-way valve. So it allows the bees in the honey boxes to move down into the brood box, uh, but it makes it very difficult for the ones in the brood box to get back up. And so hopefully today we'll have just honey supers, full of honey, uh, no bees. Now before we start uh, taking our honey today, we do have to travel back in time for a few seconds because the bees aren't just giving us their honey, they're also giving us their yeast. So bees and their microbiota have a number of different yeasts, including conventional brewer's yeast, as well as stranger ones like Lachancia. And in addition to that, they have some lactic acid bacteria. So to get the yeast, I first humanely euthanized the bees by placing them in my keyser for a few hours. Uh, this first puts them to sleep and then ultimately kills them. While they were chilling, I took 45 grams of dry malt extract and added to this 250 mils or roughly one cup of water. And I brought this to a boil for about 10 minutes to sterilize. I then cooled it in the sink. And in order to select for fermentative yeast, I wanted to start with an alcohol content of about 5%. So after a couple of shots of vodka for myself, I added one and a half shots to the starter. This gives us a starting alcohol content of about 5% a finishing alcohol content after fermentation around 10%, which will select for yeast that are alcohol tolerant and capable of fermenting to the kind of gravities we see with yeast. So the bee's intestinal tract is mostly in their abdomen or the very back part of the bee. So this is the part I cut off and I basically squeezed uh, the intestines out of the abdomen and into the wart and I also threw in the, the rest of the abdomen as well. I then uh, stirred this to get some oxygen into it, put an airlock on, and put it in a warm place uh, for it to ferment. Once the starter was complete, I let the yeast sediment, and I then poured off the wort and collected the yeast into some vials. I then set up a second starter, this one with a small amount of DME, most of the gravity coming from sugar, uh, in order to mimic the lower nutrient environment of a mead must. And into this, I then pitched my yeast in order to get enough for a starter. This should give me a mead-friendly yeast in the amounts that I need for my ferment. Okay, here is a nice frame of honey. If you can see here, it's completely capped. So all the honey cells are sealed. There isn't really any free nectar. We got it on both sides. There's a few ants running around because the bees aren't here to take care of them, but that's a good frame. So I didn't get any video of the honey extraction, but I started with a homemade centrifuge, which did not work. So I ended up just cutting the honeycomb out of the frames, crushing it, and straining it. I collected about 8 kilos of honey in total, which isn't too bad considering this was a surprise harvest. I wasn't expecting any honey this year. To make the mead, I took a sanitized 1 gallon or 4 liter jug, and to this I added about 900 grams of my honey. Once the honey was added, I uh, topped the jug up most of the way with dechlorinated water, uh, but leaving a little bit of an airspace in order to give me room uh, to shake in order to evenly suspend the honey. In order to mix things thoroughly, I capped the jug uh, and shook it vigorously, uh, turning it upside down. Uh, I then added uh, a double dose of yeast nutrient compared to what you would add for an equivalent amount of beer. I added uh, the wild yeast.
and I then topped it up to the final 3.75 liter volume, again using dechlorinated water. And then a quick cap, a quick shake, ensured that everything was thoroughly mixed, at which point I replaced the cap with an airlock, and it was ready to roll. I then repeated the process a second time, but this time, instead of adding wild yeast, I added D47, which is a classic wine yeast often used for making mead. I did not record much video of the fermentation process, but the way I managed this was fairly straightforward. 24 hours after adding yeast, I swapped out the uh, airlock for a cap and gave it a shake to degas. 48 hours later, I added yeast nutrient and then capped it and shook it to degas and then obviously replaced the airlock after. And every 24 hours up to day five, I would cap and shake to degas. Uh, then I let it sit for about two months undisturbed with an airlock in order to complete fermentation, at which point I bottled. To bottle the mead, I use a small diameter tube held in place with a small clip. This allows me to easily fill bottles. I can stop the flow by pinching the tube, and this makes it very simple to bottle these smaller volume ferments. Now to about a third of bottles, I actually added three mils of honey after filling the bottle uh, in order to carbonate the mead uh, to see what the uh, carbonated form would be like. I then capped these as well as the ones I was keeping still and put them aside for a little while longer before enjoying them. In total, I ended up with about 10 bottles of each mead, uh, some of them carbonated and some of them still. All right, so obviously the seasons have changed a little. The bees are tucked away for the winter. It's been a bit of a, a warm winter, but we finally have some proper winter weather, and so it's time for a taste test. We're at about three months after the day I pitched the yeast, and a little over uh, two and a half months since I bottled. So here on the right, we have our D47. This is the, the wine yeast, and here on the left, we have the wild bee, uh, which is of course the yeast uh, that we isolated from the bees. And I think right up front, you can already appreciate that the D47 poured a lot clearer than the wine, uh, than the wild yeast. This is kind of uh, not unexpected. Wild yeast often don't uh, precipitate out as well as wild yeast do. Uh, sorry, as well as domesticated yeast do. Uh, but it's getting clear as time goes on. It'll probably be quite clear within another month or two. So let's uh, look at the first thing here and let's see how it smells. So there's a reason why D47 is very popular with mead makers, and that's because it works really well with honey. I get a nice clear honey note. There's also hints of apple, uh, sort of a cidery-like character, and a little hint of what I think of as white wine, sort of that grapey uh, aroma. It's very nice. Honey is dominant, but there is still uh, some other stuff going on in the background uh, that the yeast bring to it. 
So let's try the wild yeast now. So that one is completely different. Uh, it's very muted. The aroma is not uh, overly strong. And the main uh, aroma that I pick up is actually yeast. It, it has a very yeasty, uh, musty aroma to it. So quite different. Again, maybe go away with a little bit more aging, but at this point in time, it is uh, a somewhat yeasty aroma. Of course, the big thing is how do they taste? So let's take a look. Yeah, that's exactly what I was expecting from the D47. Again, it's a great um, yeast for mead, and it really works here. Uh, up front is a nice honey note, uh, a, a little bit of acidity, but not too much acidity. Uh, and in the background, there's a, a whiny, grapey note, and again, a little tiny bit of apple, not acid aldehyde green apple, but actually more like a cider apple character. It's really nice, uh, easy drinking, no real heat to it despite the fact that it's around 10%. Uh, so a really nice mead, really quite happy with the way that turned out. Let's try the wild yeast now. Yeah, that's totally different again. Uh, right up front, there isn't a ton of honey character to it. Instead, there's a, a fairly intense lactic acid note, uh, making me think maybe there's some Lachancia in there, which is a yeast commonly found in bees that can make lactic acid. But it may also have been due to the presence of lactic acid bacteria. Uh, bees have a lot of lactobacilli in their um, microbiome, and so that is something that could come through there. Let's try a little bit more. Yeah, so again, the uh, flavor here is kind of like the aroma. Uh, it's more muted than what we have here. It, it is a much uh, fainter background taste. Again, there's a bit of a yeasty taste, just like there's that yeasty aroma to it, which hopefully will go away as, as this settles out. Uh, the aftertaste really is uh, lactic acid. It's, it's uh, surprisingly tart uh, for a mead, usually because they ferment quickly, you don't get a lot of acid development. But in this case, there is a, uh, a fair amount. So back to the D47, let's see uh, what the mouthfeel is like. You know, again, it's fantastic. It's very crisp uh, and dry, but still wetting. So it, it, it's not like a, a dry white wine where it's drying the palate, but it does have that crispness that, crispness that comes from, or that you uh, character, characteristically get in a white wine. Uh, really pleasant. Uh, aftertaste is, um, again, a bit of honey, a little bit of acidity, and, a, and sort of a grape-like note. Uh, really a great mead, and for something that's only three months old, I mean, this is fantastic. You could sell this in a store, and I don't think people would complain about it. Uh, the other thing, too, that's really quite amazing about this one is if you were to give it to someone and not tell them it's a mead, I think what they would say is this is a nice dry white wine and boy does it sure have a, a bit of a honey note to it. It really is like a white wine uh, that has just a lot of sort of honey floral character. So let's look at the mouthfeel on this one. Yeah, so the, the mouthfeel on the wild yeast, totally different. It's uh, a little bit thicker almost, um, and yet it seems watery. Uh, so, so instead of having that nice crispness to it, it's kind of flatter. Uh, it's not as, as sort of sharp. Uh, and yeah, it's, it feels a little bit thicker and heavier in the mouth. Uh, and even, I mean, that said, it, this actually has a lower final gravity than this. This one's right at 1.000. This one's at 0 0.996. So even though it's got a lower gravity, there feels like there's a bit more uh, mouthfeel there. So overall, they're both pretty good. I mean, clearly the D47, at least at this point in time, is, is definitely winning. Uh, however, you know, this one's got some interesting character. That lactic acid note is really neat. And I think over time, as this ages, as more of those yeasts drop out and some of those off flavors get cleaned up, it'll probably become uh, a much nicer mead. So I'm thinking maybe here in a couple of months, perhaps after the snow's gone, uh, it might be time to do uh, some more tasting notes, which I'll probably put up on my blog. So that's it for uh, this video on how to make mead the hard way. Thank you so much for joining me and of course my trusty bees. 
Uh, please follow me uh, on social media if you want updates on blog posts and videos. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, and again, thank you so much for watching.